بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد We were still discussing the first stage which is the stage of mastership We said that beautiful hadith of the Holy Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad that a newborn baby is a master for three, for seven years and then a slave for seven years and thereafter a representative or a prime minister for another seven years. Actually if you go and see the reality is that uh, the main duty of these three important personalities if you really study, you come to realize that, that what we should try to concentrate is to try to understand these personalities and thereafter know how to interact with our children. So we were in the first phase and that is the mastership of the child. And we came to realize some very important truths. I don't want to make a recap because there is so much to give you today also. And I don't know if I'm going to... Uh, complete the subject, but whatever, wherever we reach, inshallah, it's going to be beneficial. One of the things that we forgot discussing, which was very important, uh, is the consumption of food in the prenatal stage. That I, it is a very important subject, the uh, nine months that the baby is in the womb of the mother, apart from the sounds and the uh, kind of interaction between the husband and wife and whatever, all the things and the kind of TV programs that they see and all what they, what they do, we say that it affects the, the child or the womb or the prenate. The food also is very, very important in this stage. So much so that if a person doesn't take care, then the child can also be an illegal offspring. We have two kinds of illegal offsprings with what we call haram zada or uh, you know, a person who is illegal, illegally born. One is that due to an illegal interaction, there was, there was no husband and wife in place. There was no nikah or sigha recited. That is uh, known, right? It is something which is sinful. The child also is illegal and so on. We have another kind of illegal offspring which has been uh, which is the product of haram food so let us say the father earned from the haram way and provided the food for the for the mother and so on and this continued for six months nine months and you find that the food you see the the conception that transpired was from haram food all right and it continued even in the nine months that was also haram. So you find that the baby grew and got blood and, and bones and flesh and all this through a haram way. And so this is very, very important. Also, things like what to eat, although in this stage it is good to eat things which are, in fact, the, the women like to eat sour things, isn't it? in this stage of, seven, of nine months. But you'll be surprised, sour things has a negative effect in the, in the mind, and obviously it also affects the baby in the negative way. Although, because of you know, the states of uh, the, the, the mother, she has to have something like that. But instead of going for those fruits that have, that actually uh, are good to eat when they're sweet or they're, when they're ripe, they're sweet. But, you know, we try to uh, like eating when they are raw. For example, uh, mangoes, right? Mangoes is one thing that, you know, the, the perfectionary stage is ripe. It's not raw, but we like to eat it raw, for example. Instead of that, we should try to do what the Iranians are doing actually. They, they, they also have something like what we say, Achari or whatever they say, Turushi. Turushi is something that Turushi itself comes from the word Turush. Turush is uh, uh, something which is sour. Okay, 
what they do is they put some vegetables and they put vinegar so it becomes uh, sour and it's very good healthy as well as it it really satiates the person from that anger so these things are important then taking sour things like you know sour apples because sour apples actually can also you know be detrimental to the baby in fact a person cannot conceive if she eats sour apples in the if she wants to conceive and let's say she eats sour apples she cannot conceive and so on so it is important actually to eat sweet things for example because sweet things has a very powerful effect good effect uh, the it also strengthens the memory and so on so food is important actually there is a, it's a vast subject i don't want to cover food here all right there's so much who cooks it for example how is it cooked and when is it cooked all these things are important when it comes to food it's a whole subject itself i only wanted to touch this now let's go let's continue the subject that we just began and you know we said this is actually the stage of experience and experimentation of the baby and we must try to uh, create an environment for the baby so that there is an equilibrium of the faculties of the soul when we talked about the three important faculties the faculty of the intellect the faculty of the appetite and the faculty of anger or the irascible faculty now the ulama say that there are three states of these three faculties three states of these three faculties one state of these three faculties is known as the state of exaggeration okay i'll give you an example for three of them for example the intellectual faculty the state of exaggeration is what is known as aljurbuza or it is something in english we call deception i give you an example if when a person is talking you without even having heard the person properly you make conclusions and the person says baba wait let me finish what i'm saying this is known as jurbuza some people actually they don't listen to the the person who is speaking and make conclusions For example, they start watching a lecture, and then they have just covered a part of it, and then they try to make conclusions, and then they try to disseminate this. That you know, so and so gave a lecture about this subject, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Why? Because this person doesn't use his intellect properly. He is overcome by, by the jurubuza, deception. This is the exaggeration part of the faculty of the intellect. then we have uh, the negligent part of the faculty of the intellect which we'll talk about afterwards but this is with regard to faculty of intellect then we have the appetitive faculty the appetitive faculty if you look at the exaggerative side of the appetitive faculty you will find there are people who eat excessively or you will find that there are some people who like to taste all kinds of food they say you know actually i have not eaten uh, uh, crab for example and now aitullah sistani has said it is haram before it was allowed let me taste it no problem now this is going to the extreme all right this is known as cupidity shara okay in arabic we call it shara the person is either overeating or you know he would like to taste even those things which are haram let me just taste all right although it is haram just once i want to taste and so on he is interested in things which are beyond the boundaries this is one what is known as cupidity and some people become so greedy you find that every every one one hour every half an half hour for example they are munching this or they are having this or they are having that this is that extreme case with regard to eating as well as with regard to the uh, intimate interaction that we talked about between husband and wife sometimes what happens is that because this uh, appetitive faculty is not in its balance it is in the extreme exaggeration it says no problem my friends are going to the disco i also would like to go to the disco and thereafter what happens after that also he wants to also do and so on so these things are haram he has gone out of the boundary 
This is known as Asharah and cupidity, all right? And then we have, with regard to the irascible or the uh, faculty of anger, we find there are people who get angry in small, small instances. And then because it becomes a habit, you find that the anger is not a small anger, that, you know, he just becomes angry and the next moment he's all right. No. This, because of continuation, it becomes like a, a trait in him. And when this comes to transpire, sometimes he even makes very big blunders. You see, we had a, we had a case of one of the, uh, one of the Muslim brothers on Eid night. He shot his wife because of some some row between him and his wife. And the wife didn't die. She was alive, but he thought he's dead. she's dead. So he also shot himself and so on. This was on Eid night. This was one Koja Shia Ignashi of ours who had the habit of drinking because of, but see, how does it happen? You know, he's so angry that he goes and takes a, a gun and, and wants to, to shoot the wife and so on. It becomes, the person goes to the extreme and he sometimes hits the wife so much or hits the child so much that you find marks on the body of the child and so on. And then after he goes and buys for him a very good bicycle also. He says, this is, doesn't make any difference. What well, This trait of yours is very bad. This bicycle will not do any good to you or to the child. The child has seen what you have done. Anyway, these are the three faculties in their extreme. Now let us look at the three faculties in their negligent side, all right? So, in the intellect it was jurguza, deception. In the appetitive faculty it was shara, cupidity. In the anger side it is known as attahawur, recklessness, all right? These are the three things. When we look at the negligent factor of these three faculties, the faculty of the intellect, when it is negligent, it is known as balaha. Balaha means a person who is naive, who is a simpleton, who is a tube light. You see, when, for example, you, you talk to the person, he cannot analyze, the person's retentivity is not very powerful, and so on. Analysis, he cannot do analysis and so on. And you'll find that the person after a long time, after you've discussed something, he says, what did you say? So, you know, you, you just look at him. All this time I was explaining to you, now you tell me, what do you say? There's a very beautiful hadith I would like to quote here, which is in Al-Kafi. And some scholars mention it beautifully. This is by, it's narrated, in Al-Kafi, volume 1, page 26, and Ishaq ibn Ammar. Ishaq ibn Ammar is reported to have said, قُلْتُ لِأَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ I said to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, الرَّجُلُ آتِيهِ وَأُكَلِّمُهُ بِبَعْضِ كَلَامِ فَيَعْرِفُهُ كُلَّهُ I talked to a person, and I have not finished talking to that person, but he knows everything what I would like to say. It's not that Jurbuza, this is something else. This is like a person has started talking and you know everything of what he's going to say. So he says, I, Ya Imam, when I talk to a, a person, I see that I have not finished, but he knows everything what I would like to say. Wa man atihi fa ukallimuhu bil kalam fa yastawfi kalami kullahu Another person, I talk to him, he listens to all what I have to say, and then he can repeat whatever I say. The first one repeats even when I have not completed. The second one repeats after I have already completed, but he listens to me carefully and responds. Then he tells me however I spoke it. And the third category is that person that I talk to him and I finish my conversation. He says, can you please repeat it? So 
Ishaq ibn Ammar asks these three situations and says, what is the interpretation of this? So anyway, when he says this, Imam says, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, Ya Ishaq, wa ma tadri lima hadha? Oh Ishaq, don't you know why is this so? So Ishaq ibn Ammar says, lima hadha? And Ishaq ibn Ammar replies and says, Qultu, la, I said no. Then Imam interprets, he says, الَّذِي تُكَلِّمُهُ بِبَعْضِ كَلَامِكَ فَيَعْرِفُهُ كُلَّ فَذَاكَ مَنْ عُجِنَتْ نُطْفَتُهُ بِعَقْلِ The first category, that when you talk to him, he knows all what you, you have to say, without having listened. He says, that is the person whose aql has been mixed with his sperm. So, he was intellectual even in the womb. It's not a joke. مَنْ عُجِنَتْ نُطْفَتُهُ بِعَقْلِهِ فَذَاكَ عُجِنَتْ نُطْفَتُهُ بِعَقْلِهِ وَأَمَّا الَّذِي تُكَلِّمُهُ فَيَسْتَوْفِي كَلَامَكَ ثُمَّ يُجِيبُكَ عَلَى كَلَامِكَ فَذَاكَ الَّذِي رُكِّبَ عَقْلُهُ فِي بَطْنِ أُمِّهِ So the second category is that person who got his intellect while he was in the womb of the mother. The person who listens to you carefully and says whatever you say. All right? But he, after listening, he said that person has his aql. It was mounted when he was in the womb of the mother. وَأَمَّا الَّذِي تُكَلِّمُهُ بِالْكَلَامِ فَيَقُولْ أَعِدْ عَلَيَّا فَذَاكَ الَّذِي رُكِّبَ عَقْلُهُ فِيهِ بَعْدَ مَا كَبُرَ فَهُوَ يَقُولُ لَكَ أَعِدْ عَلَيَّا And the third category is a person who after having grown بَعْدَ أَنْ كَبُرْ When he has grown, he has become a grown up, then he got his intellect. So from here you come to realize now, what is the secret? Is it just a gift that some people get and some people don't get? No, it's not that. It is how you prepare the ground. You'll find some women don't cook without wudu. You'll find some women don't cook without tasbih. Ayatollah Haddad al Musabi, one of the great alims, one of the great alims, the mother said, you know, what to, uh, once to him, it is narrated that if you have reached such a station, you know why it is? It is so because whenever I would prepare the breakfast, I would do ziyat, recite Ziyarat Ashura, and I would ensure that I recite 100 times La'an and 100 times Salam. So the barakat of what I would recite would go to the food. And this is what happens actually. Tasbih or Tahmeed and all these things, Salawat, reciting and all that while you're cooking, it makes a very powerful effect. Especially, you know, before you want to interact physically and get the conception transpired and all that, you should have that program that, you know, at least for 40 days. If, for example, a person wants to purify herself from the flesh that has been grown from unlawful means, then that is done in 40 days. So for 40 days you eat halal and make sure you don't eat haram. And thereafter that interaction transpires. Otherwise you will find that the child is not that much inclined to good. You just imagine a six year old becoming hafiz of the whole Quran. Now if you look at the lineage and what the mother and the father were doing, they were interviewed, you come to realize they did a lot of good things. That is why the child came the way it is. So all these things are possible. You can't say that the grace is uh, less with regard to a certain person and the grace is very much with regard to another person. No. Grace is abundant. The Holy Quran gives a very good similitude. It says, وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَسَالَتْ أَوْدِيَةٌ بِقَدَرِهَا you see, the word ma'an is in the indefinite form, nakira, we call it nakira in, in Arabic. That means not, not less water, a lot of water. And also ma'an means pure water. 
There is no mudaf or no. Anzala min al-samai ma'an fasalat awdiyatun bi qadariha. It's a very beautiful way of expression that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the valleys flowed. The valleys don't flow, isn't it? The valleys are stationary. The water flows. But this is actually mentioned in a very beautiful balagha form. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the water were contained by their valleys according to the receptacle, according to the size. The hollow valley, which is so huge, will get more water. A small valley would get very less water. It's just like, you know, there's somebody telling you that there's a lot of gold being given, but it's going to be only for 15 minutes. So whatever kind of vessel you have, bring it. And however much you want, you'll get. However <coughs> much. Not that it's going to finish. But after 15 minutes, you will not. So whatever you have, isn't it? You start finding the biggest sufriya that you have, or for example, bigger than that, or whatever. So however big you get, you will get. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace is abundant every moment. Ya da'imul fadli ala al But our containers, are they ready? Are they hollow enough? Are they clean? Sometimes you'll find that, you know, somebody giving pure orange juice, all right? And then you have a dirty container which is smelling. And then you get the orange juice, you say, this person is giving me dirty orange juice. Can you say that? You can't say that because you brought the dirty container. If you would bring the pure container, you would get the pure orange juice. Nothing would be tainted. Similarly, when the knowledge is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even some people try to, to ask this, that, you know, look at these kuffar there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them so beautiful bodies and very they are very strong and they are way of life and so on. But we get sick very easily and for example, look at our, the color of our body and so on. You know what the principle is? The principle is that Allah gives good to everybody. But the problem is that our, how do we receive? What kinds of mothers did we have? What kinds of fathers did we have? What did they think before conception, during conception, after conception? How did they bring us? All these things. So this also applies to these kuffar also. That is why you'll find that spiritually they are nothing. But physically they are very good because with regard to their nutrition, with regard to how they were brought physically and all that, it was worked. So the grace comes abundantly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but it depends on the receptacles and that is us and that is why we are told as much as possible struggle before you conceive while you are pregnant after the, the immediate for example the seven years that you are trying to bring the child I'm telling you if you really concentrate you will find very powerful people and I've seen some children I remember one or two years ago I was in Najaf and I was sitting, uh, sitting near a person, an Iranian, who had a son who was talking to his father in such a way that I said, Ya Allah, I don't, I've never seen such a child in my life. The, the, the kind of conversation that was going on. You know, for example, he will, in one of the conversations he said to the father, you know that boy, he's alone, he's playing, he doesn't have anybody. Let me go and refresh him. He's a young boy himself, and he's thinking about refreshing the other boy, for example. Or, for example, he's, at one point he said, you know, but we are just sitting, we are doing nothing. But salat is important, isn't it? So I just asked the father, you know, that subhanAllah, what kind of boy have you trained? And I came to realize it's the mother who really put pains. Actually, if you go and see in the riwayat, you know, it is wajib on the fathers to train the child, not the mother. The mother should just sit at home, do nothing, in terms of wajibat. Of course, I don't mean that you just sit at home, do nothing, no. Do something constructive and, and continue doing things which are constructive. But this is like a help that you're giving to the husband. You see, with regard to cooking and welcoming the guests and all these things, these are things which are ibadat. That's why yeah, I don't know if I say to this gathering, but I say to one gathering that 
uh, those women who are doing all these things, like cleaning and and preparing the the table and and going and buying stuff and all that for the family, every time they do this, they should say, "I'm doing this for Batan Ilamba," and you will see how powerful it would be. And then never mention it to the husband. Oh, see, I did this, I did that. What are you doing? You're lazy, for example. Don't do that. Because that is as if, you know, you have a, a big treasure, and then you see there is a hole, there, then you put the treasure back in the hole. You don't get the treasure. If you really want it near Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the gist is that make everything meaningful, and you will see that it's going to be very powerful for you. So, with regard to the faculty of appetite, the extreme left, which is the state of negligence, is when a person has the state of humud. Humud is stillness. You know, he tries to get a wrong opinion about food, about marriage. He says, no, 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 marriage is not good. You know, what, what do these people do when they're like animals and so on? He's got a wrong concept of marriage and he doesn't want to get married. Or, for example, he says, you know, we have to eat very less. You see, this eating less and, for example, all these refraining from such things comes after a person has reached a very high level and that is a natural way. Not the way that you know you are, you are saying, no, I should refrain myself, for example, and I will eat only in breakfast time and at night also is going to be very less and then you are very, you get very thin and uh, you know, you are in the society, you can't even be strong. It's not that. That is not the path. The path is that you eat properly, moderately. The timings of eating, you know, according to Islam is breakfast and dinner. Lunch is not there. Lunch is just an, uh, something that has come up afterwards. Of course, some people who are sick and they need food now and again because of uh, you know those who have acidity. That's something else. But uh, moderately, if you go and see, Tawzim al-Masai has this. Tawzim al-Masai, Ayatollah Sistani has written this. That in the morning and at night, it is mustah to eat. The way Ahlul Jannah would be eating see the Holy Quran, it is mentioned. But in between is something which is uh, an addition. Now, with regard to those people who do a, a lot of uh, work and you know they have to use a lot of calories and all that they need, that's something else. That doesn't mean you don't consume food at these times also. But for those people who, let's say, are at home they're doing nothing, or they are, for example, uh, doing a job which is so easy, you know, like typing, and, and writing and all these things. Obviously, writing is not a joke because sometimes some people say that, you know, I write, but I, I suddenly I feel so hungry. So it, it actually makes you feel hungry and so on. But the mustahab thing is these two times. That is in the morning and at night. But if a person says, no, I'm going to just leave eating and all that, this is also very bad. Ibn Sina, in, in a book known as uh, Isharat, he talks about the stations of Arifin. In that book, he mentions that there are some people who even don't eat for a whole month and forget eating. They forget eating for a whole month. Yet they are so strong because their, their spiritual power is so powerful. That, that is a later stage when you get the ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it will be months you will not even feel hungry. And then after some time, now you will realize, oh, why, why is my stomach aching? And then you say, oh, I have not eaten for one month. Scientifically, it cannot be explained. And Ibn Sina also says this, don't think that this is impossible. No, it is possible. The urafa, the, the Ahlul Irfan, they come to a station whereby they forget eating. For one month, for two months, it's possible. It's not that it's impossible because of that station. But if a person wants to act like this in the beginning of the path, he will not reach anywhere. You see, that is not the the moderation is very important. With regard to the irascible faculty, the faculty of anger, also the extreme left, which is a station of negligence of this faculty, we have what we call. Um, Jubna, not cheese. Jubna is that, that uh, state of cowardice. 
there are some people who are jaban and they are cowards. See, the extreme right is recklessness, getting angry and showing force and all that. The extreme left is when a person, you know, even doesn't want to fight for his right. Let's say uh, his right has been taken. He says, no, no, I better not to fight you. I don't like this fighting. Anymore. But it's your right. Go and take it. No problem. Because he's a coward. Now we look at the balanced form of these three traits very quickly, and then we'll continue. The balanced form of intellect is known as wisdom. It's known as hikmah. The balanced state of the appetitive faculty is known as ifa, chastity. And the balanced form of the, this irascible faculty, faculty of anger, is known as ashaja'a. That means courage, valor. And if you look at the life history of Bibi Fatima Zahra you find all these three are powerfully shining. A very good example of her valor and courage is when she comes for her right in the, in the mosque of uh, uh, Medina and she, she tells those people that you have usurped my rights and so on. This needs courage. With regard to intellect also, you will find that Bibi Fatima Zahra salam, enjoyed a very high intellectual level. With regard to uh, the appetitive faculty, chastity, you will find that she was extremely chaste, such that even she would not, when somebody asked that, what about if this person is blind, he said, although he's blind, but he can, you know, smell my fragrance. And you know, Bibi Fatima Zahra salam, doesn't mean that she would put perfume and then that person would come. No. She had a natural fragrance. If you look at the riwayat, one day I did a research on this, on the fragrance of the Holy Prophet, the fragrance of Bibi Fatima, the fragrance of the Prophets of Allah, and you find they had very beautiful fragrances, like the fragrance of the Holy Prophet is red rose, for example. And it was natural from the body. So anyway, Bibi Fatima Zahra salam's chastity was very high. She, she didn't want the other, the, the blind man, to uh, smell or feel that fragrance. And she said, I can see him, for example. Anyway, there is a lot to, to be discussed about that. These are just some examples. So actually, we are trying to drive the children to have this balance of the soul, balance of these faculties. And some people say that, you know, actually, it's not so much necessary. We are good people, so they will become good people. No. There is a very great danger. If you look at the riwayat, you find that the danger is always there. Uh, scholars, now this is something somewhat philosophical, but if you don't understand, then just leave it, all right? It's not, going to, it's not very deep. I'm trying to simplify. See, in logic, we learn that there are different species as you go towards perfection. We have the inanimate, we have the animal, and then we have the human being. And the human being is the last and the highest of the species. And it's known, this is what is known in logic. But some great philosophers say that no, actually beyond that also there are other species. So a human being is not a species, but it is a genus. What is a genus? A genus is something under which other things can come. Like for example, the human being, the genus of the human being is what? Haywan. So we call the human being al haywan natiq the rational animal. And then we have different kinds of animals also, right? So we call them al haywan for example, uh, al-muftaris, uh, the, hum the, the predator animal, and so on. This is how we try to define it. So uh, the human being, the genus of all these animals is the animal part of it, all right? The differentia, the differentia, that things that differentiates one animal to another animal is that in the human being it is the rational part of it, that he, he reasons. That's why he's known as 
a human being, a rational element. But the insightful scholars say that no, actually the human being himself is a genus. Now let me explain to you in the whiteboard and then we will look at what we would like to know. Human being is inside. So the insightful scholars say that the human being is a genus, what we call, you know, to make it very easy for you, it is what we call a, a species which, is, uh, which has the potential of other species coming under it, okay? It's a genus. What in Arabic, in, in Mantek, we call genus. That's why, if you don't understand, just leave it. I'll give you more simple terms. Under which the human being has a potential to become insanun khinzir. Human pig. Or insanun sabo human predator or insanun malak human angel or insanun shaitan human satan or insanun haywanun and all these things together like the way Muawiyah was you know in one saying, one of the Imams tells him, Anta shaitanur rajim, you are shaitan actually. Because he was the Quwa al Wahmiya. Quwa al Wahmiya is the imaginative faculty. You see, if that is used in the wrong way, then you become like a shaitan who does deception always. Shaitan's work is to deceive and do this deception. So if a person, sometimes you'll find the person is, doesn't eat very much. He is not interested in, you know, these uh, appetite or something. Or neither does he become very angry. But he is makar. You know, he wants, for example, the downfall of somebody. He wants to spoil for somebody. He likes it. He enjoys it. He is known as insanun shaitan. And sometimes the person is overeating and a glutton, for example, he becomes insanun khinzir. Or, you know, actually the word is not used as khinzir, it is used as bahima. Bahima. So he is just interested in eating, like cattle. Or he becomes insanun sabo if his faculty of anger becomes so bad that it goes into the state of recklessness then he becomes a predator human being. You find that he, he loves and enjoys torturing. Saddam's son, I, I was reading this article in, in, uh, the, what, in the internet. One of the ministers uh, fled from Iraq because he was afraid. He said, you know, actually Saddam's son was actually a predator. He was like a predator. Said he would call, call me and then joke with me and he would have a cigarette and he would put it in my face and enjoy that while I was a minister. So there are some things, actually his, one of his sons was both a predator as well as a pig together because what they would do is they would put uh, videos in uh, hotel rooms and he would see what, what was happening and then he would order the man to be killed and the wife he would take forcefully and so on. These were the bad things that they were doing. So you see, when you train or you leave the children, I'm not saying now, some people say, that I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, train uh, my children because I'm also good. No, don't, don't say that because you remember that beautiful hadith that has been mentioned now and again when you go for Hajj, that, you know, one of the companions of the Imam Zayn al-Abidin says that, you know, there are so many who judge. And Imam says, no, there is a lot of dajij. Ma aqallul hajij wa akhtharud dajij. So much clamor, but so less 
of Hujjaj. Then he says, okay, look at my hand. And he says, oh, I, uh, I saw all apes. And then Imam again says, now look again. He says, I saw all pigs, and so on. This also shows something very subtle, that sometimes a person can be an ape as well as a pig, as well as a shaitan and all that. This is the potential of the human being. And this is how the human being can digress. We have a lot of riwayat. I have compiled a lot of riwayat of how people change. I'll give you one example. In the Holy Quran, we have the example of uh, uh, Nabi Yaqub, salamullah Ali, asking, you know, when Nabi Yusuf is taken by, wants the, the, the children of Nabi Yaqub want to take Nabi Yusuf, so they, they ask the father that, you know, he will go and he, he will enjoy. And uh, <coughs> Nabi Yaqub Salamullah Alayhi says, وَأَخَافُ أَنْ يَأْكُلَهُ الذِّئْبِ I'm afraid that a wolf may eat him. Here some of the insightful scholars say that he, would, he literally saw the brothers as wolves inside. And that's why he said, أَخَافُ أَنْ يَأْكُلَهُ الذِّئْبِ and notice, after that, when they want to, for example, get rid of Nabi Yusuf, one of them says, Uqtuluhu. That's so bad, isn't it? If you think that they were good people, but they were a bit rough. They were not that much rough. Uqtuluhu. Uqtulu Yusuf. Awitrahuhu ardan. This, this shows that they had become predators from inside because of their bad habits and so on. Of course, then they became good because that dream depicted that you know stars are doing such that those stars were the brothers. So the brothers became good after doing Tawbah and Istighfar and so on. But I just wanted to tell you that you know mothers and fathers who don't care of their children and say that there is no problem, these people, they will get used to and everything. No. And we have got examples of people getting into one of these things. So we should be very careful when it comes to training them in these faculties. Just give a break to them, right, and then we... Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa sallallahu ala muhammad wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin al-ma'asumin. Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad. So now, basically, you know that uh, what should you do? A very good book that tells you that you know when this, these three faculties are in balance, what kind of child you will see it has been discussed here in the book, The Refinement of Character, it's known as Tahdeeb al-Akhlaq. This Tahdeeb al-Akhlaq is one of the most beautiful masterpieces that is studied by great scholars. Allama Tabatabai also studied this as a akhlaq text. It's not easy to, to read. But I'm giving you the page number so that you can easily look at those three faculties. Page number 17, page number 18, page number 19, page number 20, page number 21, page number 22. 17 to 22, okay? The whole book will be difficult. There are places where he talks about training a child and how powerful it is and so on, but it's a technical textbook. So if you can't uh, you know, understand, uh, ask Sheikh Noor or any alim who has gone through this, inshallah. So this is as for your reference is concerned. Another very important thing in this level, the first level of child upbringing, is the importance of playing. The importance of playing, very important. Because in another hadith, it is clearly said that let your child play for seven years. Leave your child to play for seven years. Now, because of that, one of the most important things we should do is try to um, facilitate such toys that would make their brain very strong. Slowly and gradually, obviously, depending on the, the age, up to seven years. And you will find that because of the nature of the toys, the child can, for example, 
uh, do mathematics very well, has a very good retentivity, uh, is very creative. You'll find, I've seen in life and I've got experience that those people who may have very high grades but they don't have the sense of creativity, they are not very successful in life. You'll find that you know, because there's no creativity in their mind. So they, they can't write, they can't, for example, uh, translate, they can't uh, talk, they can't do so many things which deal with the creativity. It is important to train the child on how to be creative and encourage. You'll be surprised if you train your child and encourage the child, he or she would be a good poet or a good drawer. And I've seen this. I have experienced this, that because of encouragement, the person goes very high, never discourage. Yes, after the seven years, inshallah, when it comes to ta'aleem, whereby there is instructions given, do this, don't do that, that is something else. There we can talk about more, but in these seven years, try to facilitate such an environment that, you know, even if he has done a blender, let's say you, put, you give him ink and pen, and he started, you know, first dropping the ink and seeing how it rolls down and then putting his whole hand like this and then putting it on his face and putting on the balls and all that. It's your fault. It's not his fault. You gave him that environment. But he enjoys it. And let's say he did so much blunders and you came and he says, you just smiled and laughed. You'll find he's also laughing and smiling. He's also laughing and smiling. Inside you say, what has he done? <laughs> but he doesn't think like that. He says that, ah, Allah, Allah, this is my mother. This is, this is a mother. You will find that the love would be increased and increased. Because sometimes they know that they're doing blunders, isn't it? You, are, you, you know, basically you say, this should not be done, this, this should be kept here. And he does the other way around but never, never scold. And hitting, if, you, if, it, if your child is an animal, hit. But if your child is not an animal, then don't hit. Never, never hit children at all. Hitting comes at a later stage. And even that, we are told that that doesn't, you know, when it comes to hitting, you have other options and other variables to use. But hitting, just scrape it out from your mind and your heart. Never, never hit the child. Because the child is in another world. The child is in the world of uh, sinlessness. Even the way the child thinks is not a sinful thinking. It's a sinless thinking. And therefore, never, never do that. I give you that example of you know, your laptop being in your, for example, lap, and suddenly he kicks it. He wants to experience. These are the, the moments of experience. So khulasatul kalam, the gist is by and try to monitor what toys you are buying. One of the things that we usually buy is those games, you know, uh, for, for young children, uh, different, different kinds of games, and then you teach them and all that. That is also very detrimental. In one article I was reading, um, if I'm not mistaken, in the Ebek magazine of the Jehovah Witness, or it was another magazine whereby the person made a study and said that, you know, one of the reasons of epilepsy is such games. Such games can cause epilepsy. There is a potential of epilepsy caused when such games are played. Like, you know, uh, PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. I don't know what is the reason behind that, but then it, uh, they, they give some evidence. And, you know, these evidences are based on experimentations. So it's very important for us to know what kind of games we are you know, uh, buying for our children, especially the best games are those things which like Lego, like you know, uh, plasticine and all that, depending on the age, obviously. Uh, if, if he's very young, he's going to eat the plasticine, for example. That is not uh, required. But then with the help of some of the psychologists who, who have gone through different cases of children and, uh, they, they didn't really write this is for two to three years old, for example, and so on. But 
the importance should be that I am trying to train my child's brain. Very important. Or I am trying to make my child feel as a mother. Even you know, with regard to girls, they usually like specific toys. And as, for example, they are acting to have a baby, you should also teach them indirectly that you know the baby is not is not feeling well, so you should do this and you should do that. And slowly and gradually they do get those very beautiful sensations and the, the feelings become so pure. It's as if you are teaching them motherly feelings at this age, slowly and gradually. Indirectly. Because you know, it likes to have a doll, for example, and so on. So the toys are some other things which are very important in this stage. Another thing which is very important in this phase is the school that this child will go at the age of, obviously, you know, with regard to instruction, which is said seven years is the right. But then these days we take children for nursery and even uh, you know, kindergarten and all these things, which some great scholars say don't do that. Said, like Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli was saying, that you know, uh, those people at the later age of their life, when they take their mothers and fathers to the people of the old, the, the home of the old, the mother and the father should analyze and say that when they were young, where were they taken? Where did we take them? So this is the effect. When they were young, they were just taken for. In, in this kindergarten and all these these places whereby they are not uh, and a, a maid is taking care of them and you find some both mother and the father goes to work so the maid takes care of the child and the result of this is when they grow they also say that this this only this mze um, and this uh, must go to the to that home whereby you know will be taken care of properly and this is there sometimes it is not it's this way it is in another form. For example, I'll give you an example. In Hajj, there was an old woman coming from Tanzania, one of these African countries, I think it's Tanzania. And his son and daughter-in-law who are coming from UK. The son just went to visit the mother once and said that, now, nah, Jarunati, you come to a hotel or something, and we'll just visit you and all that. The way the interaction was, it was such that you would really be surprised. This is the father and the son, the mother and the son. The mother is a very powerful figure, subhanAllah, if you look at the riwayat. Mother is the root, om, om. The mother's station is very high. Now, this person, who has been trained by the mother and grown like this, prosperous materially at least, he is indifferent of the mother. The reason is simple. The mother did not take care of the child very well. It, it comes back. So Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli in his tafsir class said this clearly, that you know, if a person you know, uh, leaves the child with these nannies and all that, you don't expect that this person will serve you when you grow, you know, you will also say that you now my mother and father are very old, take them to the uh, home for the old and so on. And this is happening. You know, okay, I leave the non kojas because we are in a community, right? Uh, which are, which really take care of these things. I don't know about the West, but in, in East Africa, we don't do the such things. But there are, there are cases in Iran that these old women and old mothers were interviewed. And one of the old mothers was interviewed in these old homes, uh, the homes for the old. And she was asked that, you know, you, uh, your son has brought you here, what do you feel? You know what the mother says? I just pray for this, my son, no problem. Even if he has kept being here, no problem. But I just pray for him. It, you really feel it, you know, you say that subhanAllah, this, this old woman is still praising the son and the son has left him here, but why should the son leave her in this place? These are the things which are very important, that's why even if you have work, even if you have very good work, leave that work in the first, first years, you should pay attention to the child. Even if the child makes a very big blunder and sometimes hurts you, let's say, 
that that incident that I told you that the chai hot tea spills on you. It's not easy. It's difficult. But you just smile it off, and and sometimes the vibes tell the child that this is something. This is a blunder that you have committed. But you see that the mother is just smiling at the child. Gets all that. Says that you know I have to be patient. In when I get these problems, I have to be patient. You are not giving any instructions. You are just interacting that way. So these are very important things we must understand. Another thing, so school environment, why I say important? I remember I uh, was once upon a time teaching in Mutazir Islamic Seminary. We, have, we also have a nursery there. And uh, once it so happened that we went to the international school just to, to drop somebody. And uh, that person told me that, you know, the headmistress, that this is the headmistress, and she had worn shorts at that time. The headmistress was wearing shorts. The teachers are wearing, you know, uh, such clothes that, you know, you cannot even say, you cannot, you cannot say how they are wearing. All these things are there. The child looks at all these things and thinks this is natural. It's not something which is, so, so it does affect the child especially those children whose sense of tamiz become very fast. You know, some people are mumayyiz at the age of six, like this uh, young boy, Tabatabai, I don't know if you have seen him, Sayyid Muhammad Hussain Tabatabai, the one who, who, was the, uh, who had memorized the entire Quran. He was a mumayyiz, so if a lady would come at, at that six years, he would say, no, no, sorry. So why? Because the father said, no, he, he's a woman, he, is, he understands all these things. So there are some people who do understand these things. We should be very careful. Especially if it is a male child going to these places and they are, the females are dressing the way they are dressing and so on. The environment of the school, very important. What kind of children come in that school? What is being taught? No, no, it's a very good school. You know, it's an international school. We are paying these many dollars and so on. That is not enough. Go to the school, analyze it, look at what, are, what is the classroom environment, what are they being taught. This is also very important in these first seven years. Also, another thing that I, I observed myself, the neighbor environment also. What kinds of neighbors do you have? I've seen a family, uh, because they are, they are irreligious, they said, no problem, my, my daughter goes to their house and they eat eats in their house and they are Hindus, there is no problem. This is this should not be the case. So even they, the, this child would get the Hindu habits and so on. It's possible because neighborly relations. So neighbors are very important. Even if they are Hindus, you have you can interact with them as a human being, but you should know what are your don'ts and do's so that everything goes on properly. Even the places of visit, these are things, these are points that we mentioned. Now, another very important thing that happens in this phase, these first seven years, is imitation and mimicry. Experience is there. Experience is input. You know, uh, Tony Buzan has a chapter whereby he talks about garbage in, garbage out. So the, if you have garbage that you are giving to your child, when it comes to those things that he sees or hears and all that, the output of the child would be garbage. You'll be surprised. Sometimes he's talking things which you can never even imagine. How did he get that? It's from the school. And because he has fixed the imaginations, you see, the, the imagination of the color of the people, of the kind of, for example, interaction of the speech and all that, because the imagination is working, and, he, and the child starts thinking and so on. And when he speaks, you say, why are you speaking like this? You should not do that. It's because garbage was given. Garbage in, garbage out. So now it comes to uh, what he's going to do when he sees the father and the mother. You find sometimes surprising that you wake up for Salatul Layl. He will also wake up for Salatul Layl. You wake up early in the morning for Salatul Subh and you want to go for prayers. He also wants to go for prayers. <laughs> Not that you have given any instructions. No. 
For example, you'll be surprised there are some people who, when they want to arrange the table, they would arrange it in a very systematic way, put the salt where it is, put everything where it is. And the moment somebody does wrong, the child says, but you know the salt place is not here because of this, it should be there. Because he has seen that this is how it is arranged. It's not a haphazard phenomenon. The day when the father doesn't go to wash the hands, the child says, but Papa, you have not washed your hands. Why are you coming? It's dirty. Go and wash. Without you be telling the child that, you know, washing the hands is important and so on. So all these seven years, this is what they get. This, this is what they learn. So it includes eating habits, reaction when distressed, thinking habits, habits of worship with peace, orderliness in eating, sleeping, arrangements. Like, you know, I was talking to one gathering about sleeping, correct? The father and the mother should try to plan the sleeping habits in such a way that are completely Islamic. For example, it is makru to sleep between Fajr and sunrise, because that time risk is given. That time, the beauty is maintained. If a person wants to really look beautiful, and ugliness should not cover her slowly and gradually, that is a time when she should not sleep. Number two. Number three, even sickness doesn't come. The one who sleeps at this time gets sick, and so on. There are so many things in this time. And this time is a time of actually ibadah. Then, after sunrise, some people tend to sleep because they say the whole night I was awake and so on. That is something else. If you have an older, then you can recite Ayatul Kursi and sleep. Even it is said that in this uh, time after Salat is so, let's say you are very, very tired, then you can recite Ayatul Kursi and sleep. That covers it, no problem. But there are some people who sleep at 9, 10 because they don't, they have a lot of money, a lot of businesses. They don't have anything to think about. So they sleep, they sleep at 9, 10, and then at 11 they go to their office and they start munching something, and then they start eating their lunch, and then again they, are, they want to sleep and rest or have a siesta or all these things. Such people, you will find the sleep at that time, at about 10 o'clock, 9 to 10, this morning sleep makes the person have views which are bay, which, which don't have a substance. So let's say if you ask a person that uh, what is your view concerning so and so, and then when you listen to the person you'll be surprised this, what kind of view is this? He doesn't know what he's talking about. This is, just look at his sleeping habits. You'll find that is the time when he sleeps a lot. The best sleep is midday sleep. Midday sleep, there are two interpretations for that. One is just before Zohar, 30 minutes before Zohar. For about 5 minutes, 10 minutes, it's okay. It's not that you have to sleep for. And one interpretation which is more correct, uh, after I have done my research, is that it is in midday. There's after Salat. After Salat, Zohar and Asr have a nap of about 20 minutes. And then see, you will be fresh throughout the day. This is, the, this is known as Qaylula. And this sharpens memory, may, enables you to wake up for Salatul Layl. It's very powerful. It is said that Shaitan don't do Qaylula. So do Qaylula. Right? They don't sleep with you. Okay? And again, uh, this is a whole bahth and discussion that what when we talk about Shaitan sleeping with a person, or you know, going into a person, what do we mean? And who are they? This is another subject I don't want to cover, but it's important to do Qaylula. And then one of the most dangerous of all sleeps is at this time, when it's near Maghrib, the sun is setting. That's the worst kind of sleep. If I, if I show you the riwayat, you'll, be, you'll say, I'll never sleep at this time. It, it actually eclipses the mind. And in some traditions, it gives the sense that the, the person loses half of his intellect. So this, this is the time you should not sleep.
be very careful. And the moment, let's say, the whole day you are at work and you came back and you're so exhausted and now you are nearly sleepy and all that and you slept for a few moments or maybe five, ten minutes and you woke up, quickly do wudu and say, Ya Alimu, Ya Hakimu, Ya Alimu, Ya Hakimu and say, Oh Allah, sharpen my brain, give me knowledge, give me wisdom so that that effect goes away because the effect is very, very bad. That is the sleep that actually uh, what affects the mind. And the mind is a, a big ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we have a sleep also which is between Maghrib and Isha. Let's say you did not sleep in this uh, sunset, but then after Maghrib you felt so sleepy, you are at home. You recited your Maghrib and you slept. That is also not a good sleep. That is the time when again risk is being given. And you know, risks are of two kinds. Risk a maddi and risk a ma'anabi. We should not try to say, oh no, I got my business, alhamdulillah, I don't need that. No, there are different kinds of risk. There are, there, for example, you may have got something that you actually needed for so many years. And that is the time when the angel is coming to give and you're sleeping. So you are deprived of that. So that time, be very careful. Between Maghrib and Isha, after Isha you can sleep. And actually our great scholars would sleep very quick so that they can wake up at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock to start their day and recite Salat al and so on. When I looked at uh, the, uh, according to one article, for example, for a place like here, East Africa, 10-ish, 10 10-ish 10 10 is very good to sleep. It's known as beauty sleep. That is uh, at 10 o'clock, for example. But well, Amru Sahl, what I wanted to draw your attention to is that look at this, this is a nizam of sleeping only. Again, we have a nizam of eating. How to eat, what to eat, when to eat. When you are eating, for example, how do you eat? All these things are there in the Tawzeel Masai. We don't look at the Tawzeel Masai, but when you look at it, you come to know all these things and orderliness. So when the child looks at this orderliness, he follows. And I've seen some children following. Ajib, you find, subhanAllah, how is this young boy doing all these things? But he's following because the ma mother and father are doing it. Especially the mother, because the mother is very, very near to the child. Another thing is, which is very important in this age of one to seven, is giving respect to the child. Very, very important. If you give respect to the child from the beginning, and because actually the master is always given respect, so you consider him as a master and you really respect the child, you'll find that after seven, the kind of respect the child is giving is just tremendous. And all this is because for seven years you've been respecting the child. So you know the question that one of the sisters here yesterday said, you know, two big children and two young children. They are fighting, or one or two are getting angry and the others are listening and all that. This is a challenge, but you can solve it. How? With the language of love. By going to those, those who, uh, big children who are angry and saying that, see, both of you, I love you, and both of you are good people. Of course, sometimes, you know, uh, shaitan comes and says, tu alokane matwa beche. You know, this is how it talks. There is nothing like matwa bechi. You, know? you are trying to straighten everything with the language of love. If you really tell the two children, for example, uh, hug each other and, and smile at each other, and I like both of you, and both of you are important. Just this language to the elders and the youngsters are just looking. That's all. They should just look. And then you smile at the young, young ones. Slowly and gradually, this will, it will change completely. The anger would not be, you know, expressed the way it was expressed. So we should very much work, especially if there is a kind of rift between the young ones and the old ones, if, if you have not done the training. Otherwise, there should be such beauty and harmony among them that this incident should never transpire. The unfortunate thing is the schooling. See, and we have to, see today sometimes a person would ask that, 
if you are talking about school, then it's very difficult. You know, you can hardly get a school where, where you get perfection. Yeah. You are right. So the mother has to work a lot in the house to see how the, the baby or the, the child is reacting and to straighten the habits. Another very important, this esteem thing is one of the most important keys to even building the personality of the child. Have you seen, I, I've seen youngsters, young ch children coming and saying, can you keep quiet? I would like to tell you something. <laughs> a young boy telling you that, I, I, I have never seen such a you know, phenomenon. But you see a young boy, can you keep quiet please, pay attention? I would like to tell you something. How can he get these skills? This is because from young age, the mother was giving respect to the child. Such that the child practically knew what was Izza, what was this respect. And now, and you find that he, he also has personality. He stands like this. How are you? You're all right. You are surprised. How can this young boy act like this? But he can. Why? Because the mother taught him. You'll find one of the things that I found in, in Iranian especially. Iranians have this thing. Even, even one beautiful hadith that I came to see about marriage. That if you want your child to become shuja, then marry an Iranian. They work on this very well. Sometimes you find this youngster is, you know, trying to uh, disturb the whole environment of somebody's house, you know. You feel angry, but they are uh, they're quiet. The, the wife doesn't say anything. The husband just says, can you come here, quick, please? Baba, he has put paint over there now. What will I do? No, he doesn't scold at all. And then he can also pay for that. He says, that, sorry, my child did that. But he doesn't just because to please that the person when he's gone to, you know, he starts uh, hitting the child. He doesn't do that. So the child, even after going out, is you know very happy with the father he's very powerful and after a certain age the child is a man he knows what to do he also you know instructs and he tries to control and all that because he has been given this akhlaq is is very important respect even the small child that you have even if he or she so this paato for example he is doing he's urinate, urinating on the bed. You want me to respect him? Yes, you respect him. He is an insan. And after some time you see what he will do. He will do wonders. But the problem with us is because we look at others and say, ah, that harap that he has and you start hitting the child and suka Don't think you are doing small, no, you are damaged him inside. This same child tell him to give a speech at 14 years old and say, what will people think outside there? How will I start and all that? You're going to get us afraid. Why? Because you have instilled that fear. You have tried to degrade him. This same child, when he grows, he will degrade others. Why? Because he doesn't know what is Isa. He was degraded always by the parents. For example, I'll give you one very good example. Some of our, some of us may do. I'm not saying you are doing, but. We have seen this, that you know, your child says something which is extremely bad, okay, in a gathering, and you feel so much ashamed. You felt ashamed, no problem, when he's young, he doesn't know what he's doing. So you just smile it off. But some people, you know, start uh, caustically saying, what are you doing? This is extremely bad. This is actually out of ignorance. You will see, you have done nothing. You have, that thing has come out from the mouth of the child. Now, can you put it back? You can't put it back. The best thing is the best akhlaq with the child. And you will give him a lot of power within. Slowly and gradually, you will find these Iranians, they are like that. I'm not generalizing, but a substantial number of Iranians in this angle they have worked. And we have a rewire on that also. So this is a very important thing. Before I go to the next, you had a question? Yes, I just want to ask, like, aren't there supposed to be some boundaries? If, if your children are damaging people's property, I'm not saying you smack them. Don't take them there. No, but if you, if you, if you know, for example, your, that the habits of your children, uh, your no, child is that he's hyper, 
is damaging property and all that. Um, tell, tell the person that, you know, I cannot come with my child, but I'll come alone because of so-and-so. And if she says, no, 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 I don't allow you any kind of problem at the end, then you bring. Then even if he damages, <laughs> it's not upon you. No, but can you can you have like you explain the child you you know a reasonable ground because how from not what directly. from what I understand yeah. you're giving absolute freedom to the child. That is the actually is a, is a stage of absolute freedom. But as I told you that you know you you have to control the child when it goes uh, you know in the extreme by by telling him not caustically. Yeah. The vibes are there. You must understand. By, you know, by diverting the attention, you know, for example, he wants to touch something which is very dangerous and you say, oh, look at this chocolate that I brought for you, for example, and his attention is, uh, you know, diverted. But giving instructions that uh, we, are, we are going to this house, please don't do this, otherwise, you know. But you can give a pep talk and say, like, we'll be careful, they'll be How? Careful, so. There's one way you can do it. Yeah. How? By talking to your husband. Yeah. When you're going there, you don't do it. <laughs> okay? Yeah. The husband doesn't do it, but the child is looking. Okay. And that is good. That, that, that serves the purpose. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I understand what you're saying. You don't give the child any instruction. Yeah. Instruction in, in is, is eight. Eight years you start yeah. giving instructions. Okay. But for example, if my child did something wrong, then it's someone's property. Yeah. Can I not even say better? I'm not gonna in a very in a very subtle, not taunting, nothing that like, your actions, sense. your actions of saying how oh, soothing you and not looking at him and then for example trying to pay for the property or whatever whatever damage you do and all that and your state of worrisomeness and all that has given him the lesson completely. One more. What, do you think, like sometimes with children, they hurt other children, yeah. or they'll be, they might, they might be rude, or sometimes they're defiant. Maybe they're experimenting to, you know, to see the consequences. So, is it important to force them to apologize and say sorry? Or no, so never do that. Never. You apologize. Yeah. You apologize in a very uh, nice way, and don't say apologize. No, that's the wrong way. Because sometimes, mm. like a child learns how to play with spit, then he'll spit on the father or on a relative or someone. And then you've told him that uh, when you do this, oh, you'll be like, it's not nice to spit. You've tried to explain, then they do it in a defiant way. Yeah. So, are you saying we should not instruct them and uh, demand an apology? No, no. So There's another way of doing it. There's another way of doing it. And that is actually, I'm telling you, what How, slowly, yeah, can you tell us that way? slowly and gradually this is dying from our communities and all that. You find that one child is watching TV and eating popcorn. The other child is, for example, eating chips and burger. And the other child is somewhere else. The father and the mother are on the table eating. Right? This is there. Eating together and taking out discussions of the problems of life you have, for example. Which I like spitting, all right? Yeah. You can easily talk with your husband that, you know, spitting has this disadvantage, that disadvantage, by not even looking at your young one. But the young one is looking. Oh, I spit it. This was very wrong. Even if he cries and goes away and thinks that, oh, you know, you, you are trying to scold, but never show this that you are referring to him. No. Make it in such a way that, you see, this, these are children. Children are like, you know, it's a soft ground. Defiant, even if you say they are defiant, they are not defiant like those who are defiant uh, after having known the truth and all that. No. They are just, uh, we are saying zid, as we say in, in, in uh, uh, Gujarati, zid. And that also comes because of, you know, not knowing the reality, you know, and wanting some things. But this is just even asset. After some time, you find that the same person who was ziddi would come and try to hug you. And at that time, what will you do? You said, go away. No. Don't say that. Say, come, no problem. You see, if we work at these seven years properly, then you have to sleep. After that, it's going to be a very good time. But I'll tell you, after that also, we have to, when we give instructions, it should not be our whimsical instructions. Ja, paun leva ja, nea, butter, ne olu pan leo ja, ne apan leo ja, ne olu pan leo ja. No. The instructions at this stage that you give is that better homework karvanuche. Now you are trying to develop the intellect. 
Another thing, you have to brush your teeth properly. You just quickly brush them superficially. These instructions come after seven years, but you are still training. It's a training process still. It's not fulfilling your own wishes. But sometimes you, we are fulfilling our upper light one, olu light one, olu light one off. That's wrong. In fact, in fact, there should be a time when he doesn't allow you and say that no, you should not go. I will go. But that happens in the now the third phase when the person has become a successor now. The father is not there, but the son does everything. He controls everything. He knows what to say to the servant. He knows what where to do. He knows what to buy. Everything. He does it himself. And he's, he's old enough at that time. You know. uh, that is the age of uh, 15 years and onwards. We have about 10 minutes. Let me see. Um, another thing which is very important, and this brings a lot of barakat in the house and outside, is how the father and the mother interacts with guests and how they welcome the guests. Actually, it talks about social interaction, how social interaction has to be done. This is something so important, because otherwise you'll find if you don't show him how to interact, that he will go out and interact in the wrong way. Because he has seen his friends interacting in that way. But you will find some children interacting so much beautifully that you say, SubhanAllah, how did he get to know, you know, how to you know meet a person? First thing he will say, Assalamu alaikum. Then say, came to the other person will be surprised, how does this young person talk to me like this? But because he has always seen the father saying salam alaikum, came to I saw in one house, I was I had gone as a guest, and uh, whenever the child would come, even if there would be no person inside the house, he would say salam alaikum, that was a habit. And that is so powerful. In the riwayat we are told that if, even if no one is there in the house, you should say salam, because they are angels, for example, and so on. So these are the social, uh, interaction of the father, the mother, with the guests and all that. This is also something very important. Another very important point in this stage is it's a period of freedom, controlled freedom, of course. Sometimes you find the child is crying and saying, I would like to go out. Take the child out. Even if you feel distressed and you say, no, I don't want to go out, but at least take the, maybe the child wants to see something outside, to experience but if the child says, I would like to go out, take the child, if you can. Unless there is a, a, a kind of you know, situation whereby you, you have a hurdle, you can't go out. Then you try to divert the attention and so on. But otherwise, even for example, I've seen one family, it was a very good example for me. They had gone to Haram, and they, were, they had a young child. And she started running. So instead of the mother pulling and saying, the father and the mother went to went after her. She went round and round in the haram, you know, the, the space of haram of Hazrat Masuma now is huge. So round and round and they would go round and round. He, she stopped. They stopped also. This is something very good. Because now she's experiencing. You are tired, no problem. Your time is over up to a certain level. It is their time. You should make sure that they feel very good. They are experiencing. Maybe she wants to see what is this gold, golden dome? How does it look like? How does it feel when I touch, for example, here and so on? These are very important things we should bear in mind. So, when it comes to freedom, I, I have three points to tell you. One is freedom in movement. Number two, freedom in expression. And number three, freedom in action. But all these are controlled, obviously. Another point which is also very important in this stage and in this phase is inquisitiveness. You will find that at the age of three or four, the child is going to ask, ask you so many questions that you, you will feel that you will sometimes feel annoyed and say that, however, 
Please go, go and go and rest, go and do something else. You are disturbing me. No, don't do that. And even the answers that you give are so important. Because if you give wrong answers, then you are forming a wrong setup of knowledge in their mind. And that's why you see some of the these young children, if you ask them about God or ask them about some important truths, they give you the wrong answers completely. Why? Because the mother is tired and fed up of them and she starts feeling wrong answers. Never, never feel wrong answers. Of course, you have to dilute so many things. If, for example, he says, Khuda kya ache? You say, Khuda bada te ka ache? Banu nadi joto, upar ache? It means he's up, up in the metaphysical sense, not in the physical sense, but he thinks it's really up. Kya ache ko? Kya unda te joe sakte? Bau wa jo upar ache? To ne joe sakte? You cannot see. You don't say lies. Slowly and gradually you realize, yeah, subhanAllah, my mother said it this way. She was right, but she gave me metaphorical answers and so on. So you have to, with regard to the child's inquisitiveness, you should get the right information and never, never give wrong information, even if you are tired. You see, like the, the questions that they ask, there was a six-year-old, if I'm not mistaken, recently I saw her. And she was talking to me because I, I, had, I was a guest of her father. So she said, she asked me a question that uh, this is your aunt. Why is she your aunt? I said, but because she is my mother's sister. Why is she your mother's sister? I had to give answers which were correct and which would make her happy. But sometimes it continues and continues and continues and then I can tell her that I have a chocolate with me. Can I bring for you or I have some orange juice. You will take some orange juice, then everything goes to that orange juice. <laughs> then these questions stop. But then at the end, what will she say? She will say, first of all, I got, she will get the right answers. And she will be a strong personality. But giving wrong answers, I've seen, some people are giving wrong answers and the damage is very much. So we stop over here. We only have five minutes. I don't think so I'll be able to cover the second level because the second level also is very important. But I'm uh, thinking of making a mind map and sending it to you by email, right? For these three levels, okay, in English. Inshallah, they will be in point form. I cannot give you so much description, but I will send this to you for all those who are really wanting to train the children and all that, it's going to be very beneficial. But inshallah, if we get another opportunity, we can also have another workshop where we can discuss more and more. And in, in fact, I would be very happy if about two, three people together are involved, those who are actually involved with the children, if they, they can ask even more and more questions, challenging questions, so that we can get the responses. Now we have about five minutes uh, actually, 6:30, which is ending, isn't it? So let's let's try uh, to cover some more of the second level, and then we will have the question and answer session. Recite a salawat. <laughs> okay, with the, the second level, which is the servanthood now. This level actually is known as the instruction level, although it is also known as the level of slavehood and servanthood, that is after seven. You must understand that now that you have already taught the child how to practically obey, at the age of eight now, you start telling the child, do this, don't do this, and so on. But actually, the instructions that you give the child are all surrounding the things that you have already trained him about, but now it is by expression. Before it was not by expression. Before it was by action. If you prayed on time, he would also pray on time. If you, for example, was op were optimistic, he is always optimistic. If you welcome guests properly, he also welcomed guests properly and so on. He learned this for seven years naturally, without any instruction. 
but the instruction was indirect and very powerful. Now is the state of what you call tarasikh. Tarasikh is to establish something and make, make it very strong now. And those mistakes that he has, he has had in these seven years, you try to rectify in all what we have spoken. For example, when it comes to Izza, okay, respect, you find that a guest comes and uh, the time of eating starts and instead of the guest telling the guest you eat for example first he starts eating and taking this and that and all that so now you give instruction after the guest goes that this was not the way to do it if you would have done this way obviously here also when you are commanding you are not commanding as a person who is a, a degenerate person or a person who is zalil no no here also you are giving instructions, but instructions with love. Even when it comes to eating habits, when it comes to, to getting angry in small, small instances, when it comes to all these things. For example, the, the things that I've enumerated for this level where we have to make it very strong is one, tarsikhul ita'a, that means establishing the quality of obedience. Now, if he doesn't obey, that means that there are some deficiencies in the first level. So you should try to tell him that, come on, you should obey your father. Although he's not saying anything, but you should obey. I know he is joking, but he's your father. Sometimes it is vice versa. The father tells the child that your mother is, is taking it lightly, but then you should know what you should do and so on. So you are trying to strengthen it, but now with expression. Before it was not with expression, before it was with action. Number two is Tarsikh al Izza, the thing that we talked about previously, that you know, in previously, that we should respect him. So he gets practically how to respect. Now, if you see after seven years again, he doesn't have that sense of respect, there is where you have to try to train and say that, you know, respecting your fellow movement is very important. And respect means to sit this way, not this way, not to, for example, stretch your legs near a mehman, uh, a guest who comes, and so on, to offer him something which will please him, and so on. So you are trying to teach, but with expression. And this is very important, tarsikh al And then the three faculties that we talked about, tarsikh al shaja'a tarsikh al taakul and tarsikh al uh, what you call, um, Riffa, that you see, at this age you'll find some people saying, ah, because she's young, she's young, you know. She, if she is nine, because after seven, eight, nine, if she becomes nine, that is, that, that is where she is, a baliha. So from eight, try to facilitate a certain hijab that really is a proper hijab. And this is according to Ifa. Or sometimes we find that Allah, Allah, you know, some people say this way that you know, these, these days the children uh, become, uh, they grow very fast and all that. So there's no problem if she's watching this movie. The movie is full of obscenities and all that. But no problem because, you know, these such girls outside, they do the same things. What do you expect? Now, here you're taking it lightly. You have to control what is being seen, what kind of friends she has, where does she go outside, and so on. All these things. And then here you have to give instructions. So these are the instructions you should give. If, for example, you see that she is very, uh, she can't face the problems of school and so on, you should tell her that you know you should have that shaja, that courage to go and tell that student that what you are doing is wrong, do not say such things. Do not try to attribute me to a certain boy and so on. Of course, in this stage also, when it comes to sending the child to the school also, it's very important because now you are forming the child to be strong in these three faculties. So it's Tarsikh al-Shaja'a, Tarsikh al and Tarsikh al-Hikmah. Tarsikh al-Hikmah also, when we talk about establishing wisdom, we should always see where is the, where are the problems she's facing or he's facing in life. Is he 
uh, having a good memory or a bad memory. When he or she analyzes, does she know how to analyze? See, one of the sciences that unfortunately we don't learn in school, and I saw in international schools they do learn in some phases, is how to think. Very important. Many of us don't know how to think. We generalize. That's why we have a whole science known as Al-Mantiq. Al-Mantiq is the science of how to think. Should you, for example, make conclusions from things which are not established? I'll give you an example. We have one thing that is discussed in logic is inductive and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is like this. I saw in Nairobi that one person respected me very much. And I saw another person doing the same, another person doing the same. About six people did the same. So I cannot say Nairobi people are respectful. I can't, because I'm generalizing. Perhaps there are a group of people who are not respectful, they are disrespectful. This is known as generalization. And many of the people, awam, the, the laity, they think like this. While deductive reasoning is when you have a full picture and you just narrate what is there inside. Like for example, you, have, you know all the families in Nairobi. And you know all of them are respectful. Then you can, if somebody tells you that Zaira Pass is from Nairobi, I say he's respectful. Why? Because he's from Nairobi. And you know all the Nairobi people are respectful. You have that evidence for it. So you took a whole picture and then you just, you know, uh, expressed what is there inside. But in the previous situation, you didn't have the whole picture. You had a half of the picture and you made a conclusion. Now this is logical thinking. When we talk about logical thinking, very important. Unfortunately, this is, not, this is not being taught in our schools, but it should be introduced so that the child knows how to think. And mind you, the child should also be given that interest of what he is learning, very important. If you really want success of your child, some schools do that. I have a personal experience of my, my young boy who went through uh, an Arabic school, a Lebanese Arabic school in Ipkom, and uh, where he had to learn Arabic only. But the beauty was not the Arabic. When we shifted to Madagascar, where I, had, uh, I was running a hausa, he, was always, he would always tell me that, please, can you print me this book and that book? this science book and that science book, I would like to read it. I was surprised. I said, how does he get this interest? I came to realize the teacher tries to plant that in the mind and heart, that you know, this is, this is the reality of what we are learning. This is the fire, the, this is the, the thing that we are going to come across and so on. So this is also very important. If the teacher doesn't do it, then the mother and the father should do it such that tomorrow she will say that, no, I'll, I'll solve it myself. Why do you want uh, to keep somebody to give me tuitions? I don't want tuitions, I'll do it myself. I'm interested in it. And so knowledge becomes interested. Uh, the knowledge itself becomes interesting for the person. So this is one thing that we have to do um, with regard to the child. So another very important thing in this second stage is is the Yadu Tajruba. What is, is the Yadu Tajruba? You try to widen the scope of his experience and experimentation. Before it was very shallow because he was only in the house. Now you widen the scope. Give the trust on him. Give Sadaqa on his behalf. And if he has to go to travel to a certain place to see wild animals and to have experience and all that, Try to find out what gathering is going to be there, who is going to, for example, monitor and all that, and allow him to go to these excursions so that he can get more and more experience. Experience also in books. Sometimes you'll be surprised. The father is reading a very high-level book. The son also says, I can read this also. I have read three, four chapters also. I understand. Let's discuss. How beautiful it is this? The child is now discussing the same thing that the father is learning in a high level. This can happen. Give him the, even, even today we have very beautiful documentaries. Like 
you know, some people have this kind of stereotype, oh, I will go to Harvard University and Oxford, and I don't know, this university and that university. There's a very beautiful documentary that shows what is, what are these universities actually about? How do they teach? What is that environment? How vulnerable is the environment? We think it's going to be a paradisal place, but there are so many things which the person doesn't realize. In fact, our universities, Islamic universities, have a more conducive environment. If I tell you in Qum, the environment that we have, how the, our professor comes and teaches, and how respectful the students are, and what kind of knowledge we gain, you say, SubhanAllah, this is really a university. So, Experience and experimentation should be more for the child in this level. Another very important thing uh, at this stage is trying to monitor the child in all, in the entire program of his, you know. Like for example, from morning what is he doing and discussing it with your spouse, saying that, you know, this is the place where he is lacking. This is what he is lacking. This is what he is not doing. He should not know about it. And then slowly, gradually giving instructions of how to go about rectifying himself. And there is a whole program for it. That you know, what are the steps you have to take? But time is very much limited. Let me quickly give you a khulasa and a, a synopsis of the third stage also, and that is the stage of uh, representing the father and the mother while well, you know having been trained for 14 years now is the 15th year this 15th year is actually the year whereby you will clearly know that have you trained the child or not because if you have not trained the child he'll not do the thing that you wanted before you were giving instructions if you have trained him properly without you telling him, going off the light, because he knows that at 10.30 the light offs, you will go in off the light. He knows that every morning you put the, you, you take that Quran and put it in the table and then start reciting. You see before even coming to recite, the Quran is there on the table. He knows what, what should be done. He knows his responsibilities. This is in the, in the 15th year. Now let us say that all these three phases are over. All these three phases are over. And still your child is disturbing you, not obeying you, having so many problems. What should you do? Who can tell me what is the solution? Of let's say now the time 21 is over now, but still you find that he goes out with girls, he, for example, listens to music, he is disobedient, he even, you know, starts uh, rebuking the, the religious people and so on. What should you do? How can you train? Is there a chance to train? Dua. She says dua. Very nice, very nice, very good answer. But is there a practical way to interact with the child and rectify? Dialogue. Dialogue? Dialogue is difficult. You say, whatever you say is, is, is uh, of those past people. What is it? What is it? People of the past, they were speaking like this. Uh, you are a Mze now, you know. Don't talk nonsense. We know the world. I'm talking about the youth saying the, to the father. Do them get up. <laughs> <laughs> so he will, uh, the reaction is going to be even more sharp. I remember two years ago I went to Dar es Salaam, there was a young lady, the mother and father said, please talk to her, she's, she's, she has run away with a boy who is uh, not a Shia, he's a Ismaili, I don't know, and I don't know, she comes after one or two days. Now you know, when a boy runs away somewhere with his friend or something, you say, okay, he's a boy. A girl running away with a boyfriend, and you don't know what's going to happen and so this is how it was. So I talked to her and uh, she came in the Musafir Khan and as I was talking to her, she said, you know, my father calls me what? She, he calls me a prostitute. You think I, I like to come to a house like this where my father calls me a prostitute? 
and you think I'm a fool, I can do whatever I, whatever wrong that they think that I'm going to do, and so she had she had a lot of points with her. She she had a lot of points. The way she said, you know, my mother thinks I'm a thief, and that's why she locks everywhere. Am I a thief? As she was talking, I came to realize that the training that was given to her was wrong from, from the onset. The father is now crying because of what he had done before. He called her bad names. Okay, she may have committed some mistakes, but with the language of love, you can really attract even these young people. It's only 40, which is a very difficult age. After 40, you can't rectify quickly. 40 is a very difficult age. So before 40, you can rectify yourself. Even after 40, it is possible for rectification, but it is something like as if you're carrying a mountain. So before 40, you can change the person, even if she's 20, 21, 25, 27, 13, 16. So anyway, this, this is what it is. Now, I'm asking you this question. How do you rectify such a situation? Whereby she is now 18 years old already, and she has got all these bad habits and all that, and she looks at uh, movies which you can even not look with your wife and so on. What is that? Sorry? What is that? The answer. I want to ask. I'm asking you the answer. Ask me. Yeah. As you're saying, you stay with the parents. Yeah. And if the, par if the, par if the pa father tries to, try to talk to him, yeah. and he might not respect what he says. So there might be someone that the boy looks up to, or the girl, and maybe that person can help. But that would be what, you know? Like, why did he, did he not tell me straightforward? Why, why is he coming to tell you? So now he also, he has also made me Zaleel near you. So how can you as parents rectify? Yeah. He says, Salah, what is Salah? <laughs> my, all my friends don't recite Salah. It's a burden. You old people, you know how to recite Salah. How, you see, there is a way, there is a method of rectification. I want you to think, maybe maybe from the men's side, if somebody can tell you. Say, yeah, but. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> the language of love. You are near, but what you do? How? Love? You say, I love you? No. Well, what you do? Maybe you can try and like uh, glorify John or like the reward system or like all the positive. I, uh, positive is important. What you're saying is right. But there is something you have to do practically. Yes? I think uh, this generation, they like to hear reasoning. Why not? Why? So give reasoning, scientific reason, explain in detail why we are repeating. Even that will not. Even if, unless the person, unless he has been trained to reason out and accept reasoning up to that level. He has not been trained like that. He has been trained to, to see very good, you know, attractive movies and attractive magazines and going to parties and all that. This is how he has been trained. Not that the, the father and mother practically did that, but they said, ah, Charunan Oche, Charunan Oche, he's, he's young, he's young. And suddenly they came to realize he's out of control. How can we make that into life? Yes. Can it be the environment you set for them? So, because if you're, we're talking about an 18 year old, you're talking about somebody who's perhaps still living in your house. Mm -hmm. So, the kind of environment that you set where there's love, there's acceptance and forgiveness. That, okay, we understand you did this. You know what? You're still young. You can, there's all, you can always tell you're still young and he's 25. No, no, no. Okay, even if he's 25, but if you tell him you're still young, you, yeah. there's always time for you to turn back. Yeah. So let's look at that way. And he let's doesn't know the language back. of uh, turn back and all that. Don't, uh, uh, mula mula, just leave this mula mula. <laughs> yeah. I think counseling would help. Counseling? Or counseling, Dr. Sam. <laughs> your, your hair will come out, really. <laughs> 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 What if you sit down with him, like forcefully sit down with him and her, talk to them, to ask them what 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 did I do wrong, or where do I need to correct myself, or what do you want from me? 
or bond with them, go out with them, do something with very them. Very good, very good. You are near to, to the answer that I'm to give. Yeah, use the things that he likes, use the places that he likes to, to talk, uh, to be able to talk oh, to Oh, let's go to the disco, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, For maybe, example, maybe there are a couple of things. Maybe if there is a disco as well, maybe there is another place here also that he likes, uh, something that he likes. Maybe you can do that. You are near. What, you know, what is the answer? The answer is that now is the station of friendship. Friendship. You know, to a friend you respect. You respect the friend. And you love the friend. Even now, you see, uh, what will really uh, hit him down, that this is the father, he is respecting me. He is helping me. He is talking to be with, with care and love. And at, of course, the first time, it's going to be very difficult because he will be doing things which are incorrect and you can't rectify it. But slowly and gradually, it will be rectified because this should continue. It should not be like you're patient for about one, two weeks with all the problems that you have with him and, and then it bursts. No, don't do that. Go slowly and gradually. A time will come that he'll say, Ya Allah, this is the same father. I was disrespecting him. He has been respecting me. He has been doing all these things. He's caring for me. There's still, I, you know, I talk to him as if I'm a friend to him. No, I should go and tell him that you stop. I will obey you. Tell me what, what I have to do. But this should be natural. It should come out naturally. So this is the phase of friendship because you have not done what you are supposed to do. <laughs> and sometimes it's because of our ignorance. That, you know, we were not taught through the, you know, these things and so on. And we did things and we want to rectify. Rectification, you see, uh, there are some things, however, which are very difficult to rectify. Okay, this can be rectified. And Allah, as she said very rightly, that dua, dua should be continuous. The mother and the father should do dua for the child. So that rectification pro process will transpire. But there are some things which are so damaging, like, for example, uh, humiliation of the child from young age and instilling fear. Hey, Baba Buddha, we just say, hey, keep quiet. And you know, he's afraid. <sighs> Nothing is there, actually. No monster is there, but you are trying to instill this monster that he, if you don't eat, the monster will come and open his mouth. <laughs> so he's eating and eating and eating. Okay, he will eat, he will grow properly. But look at his character, you will find that his character will, will not be very strong. It will be always full of fear. If the fear is proper fear that he sees something is happening, like the dog is attacking or for example, that is something which is natural, no problem. But that fear that you instill in his mind and it goes, even while he is sleeping, he says, nah, light should be on, it should not be off. You have seen some people, they can't sleep because the light is off. If this continues, a time will come that you will find that the personality is not good. How will I rectify? Again, here also dua is so powerful. I have seen some people who didn't have good personalities. But because of the dua of the parents, they changed. Yeah. So dua is very powerful, as she rightly said. But friendship is, this is, when you want to rectify, you rectify by befriending. In case we've messed up as parents in the zero to six, yeah. uh, zero to seven stage, still now the child is in the seven to 15, fourteen. Then here you start the first phase now, yeah, of him being the master, and of course controlling, like when he wants things which are detrimental to him and dangerous to him, you divert his attention and tell him, so, please, Papa, this thing it cannot happen because of this, this, this. You will understand. The language of love is so beautiful. But it is not as simple as it was in the first stage. Because the first stage, he was very sinless and he did not have even tamiz, he was not humayiz, he could not decipher all these things. But this is how some of the scholars say that then the child of bringing starts at eight then. That, you know, he becomes a master at eight to fourteen. It, so it delays actually. It's not like the first uh, uh, situation whereby you know it starts from one to seven. What about stubbornness? Yeah. 
how, how do you avoid that? Stubbornness from your side or from the child's side? From the child, obviously. You know, the, the, sometimes they, they just try and, like, you tell them something, they just don't know to listen. Yeah, I've seen this. How, seen, how do you uh, stop that? Then? No, you can you can stop that because uh, as I told you, the indirect way is the best way, right? And it depends on which phase are you talking about. Are you talking about the second phase? Where second, like, okay. second phase. Because if you have not done this, maybe in the table talk, this should be there. Namaz. You see the stone. Have you seen a stone? This child doesn't have a stone in his, he's not stone hearted. You look at a stone and see small drops dripping on the stone. One day it's going to crack, isn't it? That also will, will change. It, it happens daily. It you happens explain daily. It and you explain, yeah. it. explain it, but be very like careful of not explaining it in such a way that he says, I thought that was my my I did So there are many ways and means. Let's, for example, the father should say, let's go and pray in, in, for, in the mosque, for example. And, while he's taking the child, he explains to him, and then the next day, let's say, he doesn't take him, so the mother says, you come, come here, let's pray together, and so on. Slowly and gradually, this will change. You see, in this stage, it is not difficult. Still, they, are, they, they have the capacity of absorption. It's only when uh, they, uh, they finish their 21. In another riwayat, it, the, the tone is very powerful that you, after this phase, if you see that the akhlaq of the child is good, then very good. Otherwise, just hit on his back. That means now we just leave him. And you are ma'adhur. That means Allah knows that you have now an order. And you have a pretext now. Now nothing can happen because this child is like that. In another hadith, la khayra fi. So many of our children, however, have got akhlaq, good akhlaq, but they have got some deficiencies as well. Now, with your two age groups, uh, one to seven, like zero to seven and eight to fourteen, if you have kids at both stages, now the elder ones ask, why aren't you telling him anything? You know, so you, you get into that. To, uh, the, yeah, you should the explain to the elder that you know we are not saying because this is the the, the, the age, his age of being like this. You should explain. You see, because now he understands your language, right? Because he's elderly. And one of the most important things is to have children uh, very soon after the first child, the second child, the third child, fourth child, fifth child, like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. What you're saying right now is a hadith. I heard it says the, the first, second, third stage. Yeah. And if the child is still a problem. You tell him, Masalam, who will see you? You will, with your way, me, my way. But that is, that is when, when, they, when you know that the child actually has become hard-hearted. You can see the, unfortunately, the, the, the evil that is coming out because of the bad habits and all that. But uh, many of our children are not like that because we have a good environment in the, in the mosque, in the, what, uh, at home, when we try to control the friends that they have and so on. So there is no problem. But when it comes to a very easy stage, la khayra fi, there is no khayr. This is what it is. So I think we stop over here. Walhamdulillah, uh, alameen. As I said, this book is very good on child upbringing. Although it doesn't have all the stages, but uh, there is another book that inshallah will be soon be printed. I will let you know. Uh, those who know Arabic, this is a very good book. Al-Qariya Mubakira. Al-Qariya means a uh, person who is a genius. Mubakira, uh, 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 a quick, uh, very young genius at a young age. Li Atfalina, if you want to make them geniuses. It's a very good book. Then we have another very beautiful book written by Ayatollah Mazahiri, Tarbiyat al Tifl fil Islam. And all these are in Arabic. I'm just giving you the references that I would employ. 
this book also is very good, but what you need is that chapter, the, those pages that I told you. So if it can be photocopied and given to you, very good. The a PDF version of this is also there in the internet. Those who can find it can also download. What's the name of that? It's known as the refinement of character. And who is it? It's uh, uh, written by Ibn Miskaway, an old scholar and translated by Constantine K. Zureik. It's a difficult text to read, but there are very important principles of akhlaq which I mentioned here.